Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and I have with me my good old co-host, Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the Open MPI Project. Jeff? Good afternoon, Brock. Looks like we uh, got an interesting one today. Yes, this is, again, it's going to be something a little different than from traditional HPC, but we're going to find out for sure. We have David Anderson, who is from the Boink Project. Um, people probably mostly know Boink through SETI, but I want to verify that with David. So let's go ahead and get David on and have him introduce himself. David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brock. Okay, so David, where are you located and what's your affiliation? I work at a place called the Space Sciences Laboratory at UC Berkeley. I'm a, um, a research scientist here. Back in the 80s, I was a professor at UC Berkeley. I'm, a, I'm a, originally a computer scientist. Um, so I taught for a while, worked at some startup companies, and then... Um, Came back to the university in 1998 to start the SETI at Home project and um, later the, the Boink project. So SETI, Boink kind of has its history um, beginning with the SETI project? Uh, yeah, it, it grew out of that. Okay. So, it was, so SETI, probably should give a quick rundown. A lot of people are familiar with SETI but not, but that's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, yeah, so SETI in general is uh, is trying to find uh, life outside Earth. The particular project uh, that we're talking about here is called SETI at Home, and um, it's an example of uh, what we call a volunteer computing project, where people who own PCs can uh, contribute processing time or disk space or network bandwidth on their PCs to, to help out a computational science project. Um, SETI at Home was, was an early example of this, but uh, by no means the first one. Is it still the most popular one that you know of? Um, in terms of number of people participating, it's the most popular. Um, in terms of computing power, actually folding at home from Stanford, which is another early project, um, is the biggest in terms of flops. And... Um, the, the two very earliest projects, just to, uh, just to give credit where it's due, are distributed.net and um, GIMPs, or the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Search. Those both started around 1997, and uh, Folding at Home and SETI at Home started in 1999. Okay, and all those projects basically had their own software stack for managing this volunteer computing, and Boink is kind of a framework for implementing that. Yeah. So, all, yeah, all those projects develop their, their software from the ground up, um, including, you know, their own application, which in the case of SETI at Home uh, uh, does fast Fourier transforms on, on radio telescope data and looks for narrowband signals. Um, in addition, there's the, uh, this middleware layer that has to do with distributing jobs, collecting the results, verifying that they're, that they're right, um, you know, acting like a screensaver in the client machine and things like that. So, um, so after a couple of years of running SETI at home, um, uh, I, I decided that it would, it would be a good idea to develop a general purpose middleware layer so that other scientists could use the same approach to computing. Okay, so literally I could go download Boink and turn it on my computer computer and it, you said it operates as a screensaver so like when i'm not using my machine it's kind of cycle harvesting yeah um maybe i should just talk for a little bit about the the software the the, the pieces of software that make up boink um it's a um it's a it's a middleware system that 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 has kind of two big parts to it the the server side which is what scientists use to um uh, to deploy their projects and to uh, to manage the distribution of work, and then there's the client part of the software, which is what volunteers run in their computers. Um, the, uh, the 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 client part is responsible for um, uploading and downloading files and running jobs in your computer. You you can set it up to to act like a screensaver um, and to to start computing only when you're not typing at your computer. If you want to, you can have it show graphics that uh, that show you what's what's going on in terms of the computations. Um, 
these days, actually, it's more common to configure it to to run while you're at your computer. Uh, it runs applications at zero priority and takes takes other measures to um, to ensure that the programs don't impact the performance of your computer for the work that you're doing on it. Um, and uh, and then to to let your computer turn itself off or go into low power mode when you're not using it. So that's. Um, the the client is very config, uh, configurable. You can set it up to to run all the time, or only when you're at your computer, or not at your computer. Um, and the client, of course, is available for uh, for all popular platforms: Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux. Um, the other big part of Boink, uh, the actually probably the the larger part is the is the server side, which is what. A scientist use w- would use to create one of these volunteer computing projects, and um, the server part consists of uh, both the the machinery for handling jobs and um, dealing with errors and timeouts and all the the nuts and bolts things, um, as well as a bunch of PHP scripts that that provide um, portions of a website. It, it turns out that that. For attracting volunteers and keeping their interest, uh, it's real important to to have a website that not only explains what you're doing in terms of, of science and research, but that also has some um, community features so that the volunteers can chat with each other and um, do things like uh, uh, make friends lists and send private messages back and forth. So, so Boink also has a component of um, uh, an aspect of kind of social networking website. So if I can infer something you said there, it, it sounds like for, um, well, actually, let's take a step back. What, what does Boink stand for? for? We uh, it stands that. for, uh, yeah, Boink stands for Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Network Computing. Ah, okay. and and so you, you, you talked about the history there and, and how you got started and whatnot, and that there's two distinct pieces, the server side and the client side. Let me infer something you just said about the, the, the server side. So when I went out and looked at your site, that, you know, there's a variety of different projects that you, you know, if I download the client, I can have the client run, um, you know, any one of these, uh, you know, scientific projects that are going on right now are... are from from what you just said, can I infer that every one of those has their own server setup, or is there, you know, one master server setup and it's doling out the work for all the projects? Yeah, each of those projects is completely independent of the others. Um, they have their own server complex, their own database that underlies the whole thing. Um, there's nothing centralized about Boink except a website where you can download the software. Um, that's uh, w- one of the one of the key design ideas of Boink is that um, the volunteer can go out and survey all these projects and uh, look at the science that they're doing, look at their uh, publication history if they want, and um, decide which which one is likely to produce results that that the volunteer views as important, um, and. Uh, you you can set up the client so that it participates in more than one project. You could you can run all of them if you want. The client will kind of cycle around and uh, get jobs first in one project, then another. You can you can also tell it what fraction of your resources should go to each project. Um, so really, what uh, the at the largest scale, the goal of Boink is to is to create a very dynamic system where. Um, there's new projects arising all the time, and um, volunteers hopefully are keeping track of these new projects, looking at the work they're doing, and um, reviewing their decisions about how to how to allocate their resources. So the the, the goal is that um, is is to create a system where the computing power gets channeled to the projects that are doing the best work, the most important work. Um, in the eyes of the general public. So, quick question then. The client the client doesn't actually have any like uh, scientific capability in itself. The server distributes the application down to the client also. Like, say I've got a Boink project set up, but I need to use Gromax to run my MD calculation. 
when I download Boink from the Boink website, it doesn't have that capability. It has to be pushed to it by the server. Is that how that works? Yeah, the Boink client by itself um, is is just a framework for downloading and running programs. It doesn't actually have in it any of the any of the scientific programs. Um, when you when you first run the Boink client, it asks you to attach the client to one or more projects. So you can pick, uh, you know, Einstein at home or SETI at home or any of the many other projects. Uh, the client then does RPCs, uh, remote procedure calls, to the servers for those projects. Um, the RPC describes the client. It, it, it tells it what kind of processor it has, the, the, the benchmark values, the memory size, the amount of free disk space, um, the operating system version. Uh, the, and then the project server looks through its database of jobs and um, picks some set of jobs that the client is able to run. You know, the, some jobs may need more or less memory or disk space. The server makes an informed decision about uh, what the best jobs are to send to the client. And the, the, the description of the jobs includes the, the list of files that make up the application. Um, the application could, could have many files, you know, main program, libraries, databases, whatever. Uh, the jobs can have many input files. Um, all those file transfers go on um, asynchronously while other jobs are calculating. When it gets all, uh, when the job is staged and ready to start, um, it may have to wait for a while. Uh, eventually, the job runs. When it's finished, another another of these RPCs happens that that um, reports the results back to the server and uh, gets new jobs to run. So so it's very easy for projects to deploy new versions of their applications. Um, that was that was one of the original motivations um, in the original SETI at home, it was very cumbersome for us to deploy a new version. We actually had to have everybody manually download and install a new program. Um, with Boink, that all happens automatically. Okay, so Boink is really almost a type of resource manager focusing on this loosely connected set of volunteer systems that are coming and going. And that's actually an interesting part. How does Boink handle clients kind of shutting off, turning on, joining up, half done work, not finishing a work unit? Like, how's how's it handle all that? Well, um, there's a lot of respects in which um, managing this this pool of uh, roughly one million PCs of all different shapes and sizes um, differs from managing the nodes in a cluster. Uh, or a grid or, or a more organizational kind of resource. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, these, these different attributes of the, of the um, big set of a million computers are, are, are what make Boink different from uh, software like Condor or Platform or things like that. Um, the... Um, some of the ways in which is in, in which things differ, um, probably the the biggest difference is that the resources are not under the control of the of, of the project. They're they're owned by other people who are effectively anonymous. So, when the project sends out a job to somebody's computer and it get, gets back an answer, it it can't be certain that uh, that the answer is correct. There are um, uh, Home PCs uh, commit errors at a certain rate. There are people who overclock their PCs, and they systematically give floating point errors. There's also a, a, a small but but non-zero number of, of malicious people who intentionally um, fiddle with the client software so that it sends back either erroneous answers or answers that claim to have used much more computer time than they actually did. So, um, so, so one of the main functions of Boink is to um, is to detect these these errors and these misbehaviors and compensate for them in some way, so that the overall computing resource becomes something reliable. Um, it 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 also has Can to. Can you talk a little bit detail about 
I'm sorry. Can you talk a little bit in detail about how you do that? Because I would imagine where the, the, the secret sauce is, you know, like how did you know that you got a good answer back? The, the bottom line mechanism is, um, is replication to run each job on um, at least two different computers, um, computers belonging to two different people to reduce the possibility of collusion and to compare the answers and to compare the amount of CPU time that the answers claim to have taken um, and to accept the result only if those answers agree within some tolerance. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of subtlety and, and fine points to this. Uh, for example, if you have a program that does floating point calculations, you're typically typically going to get slightly different answers depending on what kind of processor you run it on, or even um, what libraries the computer happens to have. So, um, for some applications like SETI at home, these these small differences in floating point math lead to small differences in the answer and you can compare answers with with kind of a fudge factor if they agree within a couple of percent then you count them as similar um, but there's other kinds of applications like like Gromax that are unstable and a, a small numerical deviation early on leads to unbounded differences in the output and um, there it's, it's kind of tricky to do replication um, one of the features that Boink has is what we call homogeneous replication, which means that um, the, the, the set of, of, of platforms of the combination of operating system and processor type is divided up into equivalence classes that are, that are numerically equivalent. In, in other words, they, they always give bitwise identical answers, even for fl uh, floating point calculations. And then what, the, what Boink does, once it's, once it's assigned an instance of a particular job to a, a given machine, it will only assign replicas of that job to numerically equivalent machines. So if it, if it went out to a 32-bit Windows machine, um, the, the replicas will only go to other, mach other Windows 32-bit machines. And, and you, know, it, it may, you may have to subdivide by AMD versus Intel. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the basic idea is, is that to get, um, to get real validation, you need to do replication. If, and, of course, it's all probabilistic. There's always the chance that you might send two replicas to two hosts that, that both return the wrong answer. Um, if, if you need a high level of confidence, Boink lets you ratchet up the level of replication so that you send out uh, three copies and demand that they all agree, for example. Now, of course, this imposes an overhead on the um, uh, on the computation that you do. If you do every job twice, you're cutting your overall throughput in half. So um, recently we added a variation of this that we call adaptive replication, where um, each host has a, uh, we, we kind of keep track of his reputation, how many jobs, what, what fraction of, of jobs it's done correctly. And um, if that goes above a certain threshold, we, we trust that host, and we start sending it jobs that we don't replicate, um, continuing to randomly mix in a few jobs that we do replicate um, just to keep the bad guys from trying to game the system. Um, but with this adaptive replication mechanism, we can, we can bring down the overhead of, uh, of replication to something slightly over one instead of something slightly over two. So is your, is your protocol open source? Or, I mean, is it an open protocol? Because Boink itself is, is open source. So is it conceivable that people can write their own to this? Uh, the reason I'm asking is because I remember a couple years ago that um, some guys at Earlham wrote uh, uh, a client for folding on clusters as opposed to folding at home. And, and they had it fronting, you know, a cluster that was, you know, running a big MPI job on the back end to distribute the work to, you know, all their beefy server nodes kinds of things. Does that stuff kind of happen, or does, does Boink facilitate that, or, or how does that go? Well, um, Boink is entirely open source. We distribute it under the LGPL license. Um, the RPC protocol, therefore, is well known, and uh, it's, it's, it's documented on our website. 
So yes, in principle, anybody could go uh, implement a brand new Boink client from the ground up if they wanted to. Um, I think there's only been one instance of that. Uh, some guys from Technion in Israel implemented a version of the Boink client in Java running on Android. The idea is to do computing on um, on cell phones. Interesting. I would imagine that would be a, a huge battery drain on on cell phones, but it's still fun that they did that. Yeah, the idea is to compute while the cell phone is plugged in and docked. Ah, okay. Has it anybody ever like more than just that Earl Ham experience of, of doing something parallel on the back end? I, I mean, I would kind of assume that the, the computational jobs that are submitted to Boink are more in the embarrassingly parallel kinds of categories such that you wouldn't really benefit from having a, a cluster behind you. It'd be more like it would be exactly the same as having each of those cluster nodes have their own Boink clinic rather than, you know, just an MPI job that ties them all together. Is that an accurate assumption? Um, um, most of the Boink projects are throughput-oriented. They're trying to get as many jobs done per day as possible, but they don't really care how long a particular job takes. Um, so for them, uh, parallelizing jobs has has no value. However, there are a few Boink projects that are that are latency oriented. In other words, they have batches of jobs, and what they're interested in is getting each batch done as quickly as possible. Um, and those projects um, are moving in a couple of directions. One is that that Boink supports multi-threaded applications, so that um, you can you can have jobs that use all of the cores on an 8 or 16 core machine um, working on a single job trying to get it done fast rather than doing 8 or 16 separate jobs in parallel Um, and also a lot of projects are now looking at using GPUs uh, to, to, to speed things up and to increase throughput as well so before we get too far, um, what are the scale of some of these Boink projects, both in the number of participating members and the amount of flops? I assume the flops are going to be kind of prorated because of that uh, the replication you were doing to verify that the results are good. Um, yeah, so currently, as of today, there are 330,000 people actively running Boink. Um, active means that their computer has returned a job in the last month. A lot of these people have more than one computer, so there's about 580,000 active computers. Um, if, we, if we include folding at home in those, in those totals, folding at home is, is a big volunteer computing project which doesn't use Boink. Maybe they will someday. Um, that brings the totals up to about a half million people and about a million computers. Um, altogether, those computers are providing about six petaflops of computing power. Um, if we prorate that because of replication, you know, it's somewhat less, maybe b- between four and five. And um, as of today, there's about 60 volunteer computing projects. All of them use Boink except for um, Folding at Home. And, and actually, the two original projects, dis- Distributed.net and GIMPs, are still going using their own platform. So that's that's impressive. Whether it's four or six petaflops, that's that's incredibly impressive. And I remember when uh, when Roadrunner crossed the petaflop barrier, there was a lot of discussion at the time, saying, "Well, you know, there's actually all these distributed, um, you know, projects out there that have been over a petaflop for a long time, but they're not recognized." It, just for the fun of it, has anybody ever considered writing a Linpack client for Boink just to just to see? You know, to get well, officially. I th- yeah, I think that running running Linpack in parallel uh, would require the type of low latency IPC that uh, the clusters are good at. So I don't think you're going to get um, volunteer computing systems to to do well on the kind of benchmarks that are used in the top 500 supercomputer list. But, uh, but who really cares? I mean, the, the, the goal here is to get science done, not to, not to uh, be number one on a list. Believe it or not, that was actually the exact answer I was going after because at ISC, uh, you know, a month ago, uh, Oak Ridge decided not to rerun Linpack and actually get a bigger number then Roadrunner, they're like, yeah, we were too busy actually doing work to run another benchmark. And I think that was just 
a fantastic answer, and I'm I'm thrilled that you gave pretty much the same answer. That's not just for the technology reason, but also for the we're doing work re- reason. That that's um. So how how hard is it to to pull? And applicants have some number crunching thing, and, and I'm a scientist, and I, I suddenly realize, you know what, I've got a mountain of data, and I just cannot, you know, I don't have the resources to do it. How hard is it to port to the, the Boink system? Um, actually, before I answer that, one, let me go back to an earlier question that you answered about um, how we handle computers going on and off and joining and leaving things. I didn't really finish answering that. Um, yeah, so one of the things that um, makes this type of computing a little different from uh, using dedicated nodes like clusters is that um, uh, we don't get the, we, we don't get full time use of the computers. Boink may be configured so it has to stop computing when the guy comes back and moves the mouse. Uh, of course, people turn their computers on and off all the time. Um, so, Boink has a bunch of mechanisms that, that deal with these issues. Um, one is that that applications typically um, have to be written to checkpoint periodically, and this is this is one of the pieces of work that you have to do, or that you should do to get an application to work on Boink, is figure out the points in the application where you can efficiently checkpoint. Boink doesn't doesn't copy your whole address space or any of these brute force. Um, things that, that other systems do. It requires the application to, to write a file that, that summarizes its state and lets it restart. Um, and typically that, that gets done every few minutes. So if you uh, turn off your computer and it starts back up again, it only loses a little bit of computer time. Um, on, the, on the server side, um, the, 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 the job scheduler is... It, it, when it sends out a job, it doesn't necessarily expect to ever get an answer back. So it uh, it times out jobs, um, sends out new instances. It has a little bit of intelligence about um, uh, sending sending these retries to computers that are likely to get them done faster, so that um, you know so that we don't have to wait to validate the job for very long. Um, Another very important aspect of this kind of computing is that most of the nodes are behind firewalls or NATs, so you can't you can't push jobs to them. You you all the communication has to be initiated by the clients, um, and in fact, Boink uses only HTTP uh, to to do this communication. So the the, the client init- initiates HTTP requests both in talking to the server to get jobs to do and also to, to handle the file uploads and downloads since pretty much every everybody's firewall is set up to let uh, outgoing HTTP connections go through. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of differences between dedicated and non-dedicated resources and, and that's the, the main job of Boink is to, is to deal with those idiosyncrasies. Question of you know how let, let's say I have some number crunching program and I and I want to run it under Boink. Do you do you provide APIs for me to call or you know I, what what kind of is the typical process of you know taking some app and 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 making it go underneath the the, the Boink platform? Okay. Um, well, the easiest case is if you if your application is written in a modern language like. Uh, C++ or, or even C or even Fortran. And in that case, all you have to do is recompile it with uh, calling a, a, a Boink initialization function. You have, to, you have to replace your F open calls with, with a Boink variant of that. Um, you need to um, identify the points where your application can possibly checkpoint and put in a call to, to ask Boink whether it should, in fact, checkpoint. Um, so that whole process is usually pretty easy. You just recompile things. Um, Boink is also set up to work with legacy applications for which you don't have the source code. There's a, there's a wrapper that, that kind of provides the Boink behavior, and it, it runs your legacy application under that. Um, so, so 
that's kind of the, the, the first part is making minor changes to the source code of your program. The second part is you have to recompile it for, at least for Windows. And a lot of scientists um, develop in Linux, and it can be a fair amount of work to get your program to run under Windows. You, know, you can use either the, uh, the Microsoft tools or uh, SigWin, MinGW, things like that. Um, and if you want to not anger Macintosh owners, you also have to get it to work um, on the Macintosh. So that, that's, that's kind of the second part is getting your application to run on multiple platforms. Um, one interesting area of research right now is the use of virtual machine technology to, to simplify that and to, um, to set things up so that you only have to um, get your application to run on one platform, you know, maybe Linux, and then um, have Boink run it in a, in a VMware hypervisor on these, on these other platforms. Um, now, the third thing you have to do is to, is to write some back-end software that generates jobs for your application and that, that validates the results of jobs and that processes the results of, of validated jobs. Boink is really designed to handle a, a, a big stream of, of hundreds of thousands or millions of jobs. It's, it's, um, it's possible to submit one job at a time, but that's, that's not really what Boink is optimized for. So this, this, this back end, this functionality of, of pumping work into the system and handling the completed results, um, all that's done in, typically in, in software. You, you write programs that, that generate streams of jobs, and of course, Boink supplies APIs for doing that. Um, so those are the three parts. We've, we've, you know, we've tried to um, simplify it, document it pretty well. Um, it's... You know, I would say that uh, you can usually get things working in a in a couple of uh, person days if you have the if you have the right people. Now, when you say it has to work on Windows, that's just because most of the public out there are running Windows on their system, and you won't get very many volunteers unless you have a Windows uh, an application that can run to the Windows client. Yeah, the typical breakdown these days is eighty five percent Windows and seven percent each for. Uh, Linux and Mac OS X. Now, do you know of any universities or any type of organizations that are kind of using Boink as a cycle scavenger, like where you'd normally would see something like Condor, but instead are, are using Boink to kind of take up idle lab machines, maybe, you know, dedicate two cores out of a four core system at a, you know, an administrator's desk just running Word. Have you seen anything like that? Any examples? Yeah, there's there's a there's probably a half dozen universities and um, a bunch of companies. I don't know, maybe ten or twelve who are using Boink for for desktop grid computing, meaning um, using their own internal resources to do distributed computing. And uh, Boink works fine for that, and it has the advantage that that if you outgrow the uh, if you outgrow your own resources and you still need more, then you can ask the public for them. What are, what would you say the main advantage in that situation Boink has over something like Condor? Is it that ability to pull in the public easily? Um, yeah, I, I think that if if you only want to do um, sort of private desktop grid computing or cluster computing, Condor is uh, certainly a more mature system. It has better uh, uh, workflow-related tools. Um, Boink basically doesn't have any workflow-related tools. You have to write your own programs that, that, that manage that level of things. So the, um, the, uh, the, the, the key component is, is going out and getting resources from the public. And, it, and that's, a, that's a very, very big advantage. Um, you know, typically... At a given university, you might have access to hundreds or maybe a few thousands of nodes. Um, but uh, if you go out and ask the public, even even a limited set of the public, like the the alumni of a big university like Berkeley, um, number in the hundreds of thousands. And um, it should be possible to get hundreds of thousands of nodes just by asking the alumni. Um in general, the, the, the 
number of PCs that are privately owned is um, is a, an ever increasing fraction of the total. There's there's currently about a billion PCs connected to the internet. Um, so even though we right now we have about a million of those doing scientific computing with Boink, but that's a uh, a tenth of one percent of the total, and um, we're hoping to expand our market in the next few years. Okay, so on a kind of different topic, since Boink was kind of grown out of a previous project to solve a lot of the problems that um, managing that project had, like you mentioned, updating software for SETI, pushing that down. Now that you've ran Boink and with Boink's architecture for a while. If you would do it again, what would you change? Well, um, probably nothing in the basic architecture of Boink. The, I think the thing that I would change is to centralize some of the community-oriented aspects of Boink. Right now, every project has its own... Uh, user database, its own message boards, its own instance of all these social networking features. Um, I think that whole thing would work better if there was only one uh, kind of centralized website for the for the community aspects of of volunteer computing. Um, and that 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 may exist at some point. We're, we're moving in that direction. Okay, actually, that's an interesting bit. I noticed that so the work units and you mentioned how a machine can build up reputation. You actually publish that, or users can choose to publish that. It's almost like a little competition, and you can set up teams. And you know, the you could have you know the alumni of Berkeley have a team, and they get a total, and they can compete against you know Michigan and who racks up the most. Yeah, that's that's an aspect of volunteer computing that I haven't mentioned yet is is the competitive aspect. Um, when you compute, you get this this number called credit, which is how much work your computers have done. It's basically a flops count, and um, that's very important to some people. A lot of people uh, want to prove to the world that they have the fastest computer on the block, and. Um, uh, one of the one of the challenges in the early days of Boink was to get SETI at home users to consider running other projects in addition to or instead of SETI at home. And um, one of the reasons for not doing that is because they'd already accumulated so much credit with SETI at home, they didn't want to start o- start over at zero with some new project. So to deal with that, we we created a system where all of the Boink projects export their credit statistics in. Um, in XML form, and um, users have have these sort of unique IDs that that span the different projects. So it's possible for third-party websites to go out and download all this credit information to 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 collate everything using these cross-project IDs, and to to have leaderboards that show people's total credit over all projects, and that that provides. Um, a bit more of an incentive for uh, for people to run multiple projects. So, so that aspects of that aspect of things has we 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 have a centralized architecture for um, um, for collecting credit information. So it's kind of like really simple credit syndication, so to speak. <laughs> right. So uh, let me going back a little further in the in the conversation here. You, you mentioned distributed.net and um, and whatnot. These guys are, are, are not using Boink. Um, is there a reason that they're not using Boink, or are they competitors, or are they just that way for historical reasons? Or you know, what, what's your relationship with the with those people? Well, the the projects that predate Boink, including Folding at Home, um, develop their own infrastructures that work very well for what they do, and they're very familiar with those tools. Um, I, I don't think any of them has any objection in principle to using Boink, but um, there's no real reason for them to either. Okay, fair enough. Then uh, let me let me ask a slightly different question then about the, the community. So Boink is open source, and you said you do it under LGPL. Um, who who are the developers? And, and actually, what, what is your 
exact role in the project? Are you a developer? Are you a manager? How, how does the typical project flow uh, in, in itself? Well, let me let me back up historically. Um, I started working on Boink in 2002, and uh, I'm a I'm a programmer. I'd rather be programming than managing at any particular point. Um, later in 2002, I um, wrote a grant proposal to the National Science Foundation, and uh, that got funded. So I got some money to develop Boink and was able to hire a couple of other programmers. Uh, and NSF has, has funded Boink ever since then um, at a fairly low level. So the project consists of me and one other, one other full-time programmer and one half-time programmer. Um, and probably 90% of the programming is done by us. Um, we do get some participation from volunteer open source programmers. We've also set up a bunch of, of systems where we can use volunteer labor in, in various other ways. For example, we have a, a, um, a testing process. One, one of the challenges with Boink is that it has to run on, um, you know, uh, 10 or 20 different operating systems. Things are a little bit different between um, Windows NT and XP and Vista and Windows 7. We don't have the resources to, to buy all these computers ourselves and do all that testing ourselves. Uh, so we have a volunteer project where, where people who have all these different kinds of computers um, test our, our latest development versions of Boink. We also have groups of volunteers that... Uh, that translate the user interface text into a bunch of foreign languages. I think we have about 20 languages right now. Um, we have a, uh, we've set up systems to do customer support. Of course, when you have a population of a million people using a software product, you're going to get problems and uh, questions and customer support calls. Um, we, we don't have the manpower to, to handle those ourselves, of course, uh, but we've set up a system where um, volunteers can can uh, work as a, uh, uh, support reps, basically using Skype. So you can you can go to a, a website and see a list of of people who speak your language um, and see which ones are available to talk to on Skype right now. Um, so yeah, we, we we've had to really figure out how to leverage the um, the energy and interests of the general public. Um, not just to do the computing, but to, to do a bunch of other um, ancillary tasks. So um, as, a, as a developer in an open source project myself, I'm, I'm always fascinated to know, um, you know what, what source code control system do you use um, for maintaining all your code, and, and why did you choose it? Uh, we used Subversion. It was the, the best option at the time. You know, there may be better things out right now. Um, pretty much uh, the, the bulk of the source code is C++. Um, in the client GUI, we use a toolkit called WX Widgets, which is open source and cross-platform. And um, we use a lot of Python for the, the, the back-end scripts that you use to control the project and to create new projects. That's all in Python. And then, of course, there's um, all the web codes in, in PHP. Um, overall, it's 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 a pretty modest size system, total of maybe uh, two hundred thousand lines of code. Um, since we're so small, we we sort of have to keep it that way. Okay. So on a different note, so you mentioned that um, SETI is the largest consumer of a uh, Boink. What's some of the other large users of Boink? You mentioned Einstein at home. Um, also, what is the strangest or most interesting use of Boink? Like something, given that as a pretty generic resource, I'm sure it's about anything, but we've mostly stuck to scientific kind of applications. Has there been something that you wouldn't say falls into that category that's used Boink? Um, yeah, there have been... Um of course, anybody can create a Boink project. You don't have to be a academic researcher to, to do that. There was one group that used Boink to um, 
to explore, uh, to, to investigate a, a variant of chess called uh, um, Chess 360, where you, you, where you randomize the position of the, of the players at the start of every game. So, you, you, you know, you don't have the, just the usual set of book openings from regular chess. And they use Boink to, you know, to, to run millions and millions of simulated games to investigate how that worked. There was another project that uh, used Boink to do um, distributed ray tracing to make animations. Um, th- there's there's really projects all over the map. Um, you can use Boink uh, to do things that are not necessarily necessarily computationally intensive. You can use it as a as a framework for running any kind of application. And um, there's a project called Quake Catcher Network from Stanford that. Um, uses Boink to implement a distributed seismograph. It turns out that laptop computers have a little accelerometer built into them, and when the laptop is sitting on a hard surface, you can actually pick up um, seismic waves with it. And uh, this project runs an application that, that monitors those waves, looks for spikes, and reports them back to a server so that they can detect earthquakes faster than you can with traditional uh, centrally centrally located seismographs. Um, cool. There's a um, couple of my favorite projects. Um, ClimatePrediction.net from Oxford uses Boink to run um, simulations of 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 the Earth's climate. These these huge complex models that actually run for several months per job. That was um, a big design challenge for Boink was, was handling jobs that were that long. They, they impose a, a bunch of new problems. Um, climateprediction.net has um, vastly improved the accuracy of, of long-term predictions of, of the Earth's climate. And it turns out that the, that the range of uh, possible temperature increases is much wider than anybody thought it was before. Um, Another favorite project is called LHC at Home. It's from CERN, the people doing the Large Hadron Collider. And they used Boink to, to run a simulation program that, that was used to optimize the design of the, of the, um, of the magnets in the, in the accelerator and to, to kind of tighten up the beams of protons and antiprotons and get higher energy collisions out of them. Uh, recently, there's a project from a company called D-Wave Systems, a company in Canada that's trying to build the first commercial quantum computer. And they're using conventional computing to to model the quantum computers, predict how they're going to act, and uh, and optimize their design. So there's a project called Aqua that you can use to, uh, if you want to accelerate the progress of quantum computing. Cool. No, that that uh, seismograph one is a really creative use of the distributed system plus the distributed uh, resources. Not only did you have distributed CPUs and memory, you had distributed instruments in the in like the drop sensor in the laptop. That's actually like quick. I'd, I'd be curious if anyone else ever comes up with a similar kind of idea of using something everybody has and attaching something like Boink to it just to communicate. So uh, what's the website and contact information for Boink where people can download it and maybe run it on their own home machine? The website is boink.berkeley.edu, B-O-I-N-C. And um, you can download the client software from there. Um, And if you're a scientist or somebody who does high-performance computing, you can also download the server software from there. there's a couple of different ways to set up the server software. You can either install it on a Linux box, or we also provide a virtual machine image that has the server software um, already set up, and you can run that on uh, a VMware player on your platform of choice. Um, we also provide a um, an Amazon Elastic Computing Cloud image so that you can run a blank server uh, in the EC2 cloud and not have to worry about hardware. Oh, that's creative. That's a good idea. That's great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for doing this, David. 
Uh, this was really interesting. And this show will be available on www.rce-cast.com. And you can find all of our other shows on there and subscribe to iTunes. And we will have this up soon. Thanks for your time, David. No problem. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye-bye.